Good morning, Pittsburgh. Welcome to Pits of the Point, live from state-of-the-art Pitt Studios. I'm David Altman. And I'm Allie Ross. Thank you for joining us this morning. Pits of the Point is your one-hour news magazine show that covers everything at the University of Pittsburgh to its regional campuses. To the city of Pittsburgh, as well as national and international news. We'll be covering everything from entertainment, politics, and sports. And we'll be sure to keep you updated on all things Pittsburgh, all the way to the point. We start with terror gripping the University of Pittsburgh's Oakland campus on Monday night as police responded to a fake active shooter threat called into campus. Pitt police received several calls describing an active shooter in the Hillman Library and responded promptly to the scene. City of Pittsburgh police also responded to the call. This incident coincides with a similar situation at Central Catholic and Oakland Catholic high schools just two weeks earlier, adding more fuel to an ongoing investigation with the FBI concerning hoax active school shooting calls. It is still not yet clear if they are related. Police arrived on scene within a minute of being dispatched, finding the library full of students. Pitt and city police immediately began a search of the library, ordering students to evacuate as they swept each floor. One city police officer fired multiple shots into a ground floor door to gain access to the building. Panic students ran out of the library. Some seen jumping from the roughly 10-foot ledge onto Forbes Avenue, then proceeded to run from what they thought at the time was danger. Right around midnight, the city's Department of Public Safety released a statement on Twitter explaining that city police had assisted police with responding to the active shooter threat. The statement explained that the library had been safely searched, evacuated, and cleared, and that no shooter or victims had been found. Two hours later, the city issued an update addressing shots fired by city police to access a library door. Students who had heard the shots on the scene said it increased their panic because they did not know the source at the time. City police confirmed that no other shots were fired. Community members voiced concern during and after the incident about Pitt Police's emergency notification service, which is used to share information in emergency situations. Police did not send out any alerts on Monday night until long after the scene was cleared. Students said this created confusion as they were forced to seek additional information via less credible sources like social media or even their friends. This caused outrage in the Pitt community. Some students even feeling compelled to organize a protest concerning topics of how they felt unsafe with the lack of timely information. Chief James Loftus took responsibility for delaying the ENS messages at a press conference on Tuesday, saying that police was waiting for the most accurate information. He said he regrets not putting out more alerts sooner. We're looking at systems and we're looking at people to see what let us down in this, right? So is this a technical problem? Was this a training problem? It, it may have been. Was it a practical problem? We don't know. We're working our way through that. Long story short, so if you would go onto a screen for emergency notification system, you would see two, two boxes. One says short message. The other essentially says long message. Right? So there was a lot of information to cram out there. We started to enter everything in the short message box, and there were too many characters. So it didn't fit into that box. So we had to go down and we had to enter it into the short message box. What's left in the short or in the long message box? What's left is that header that says "Pit ENS message colon," and that's what went out. To give you a time frame, around 11:10 p.m., Pit police and Pit and city police were alerted of an active shooter at Hillman Library and were dispatched at 11:14, arriving at the scene at 11:15. Then, an hour and 20 minutes later, Pitt ENS sent out its first alert, which showed up a completely blank text. Pitt Police sent supplementary ENS text messages between 12.50 and 1 a.m. to students, clarifying that the active shooter threat had been determined to be false. Chancellor Patrick Gallagher released a statement Tuesday evening regarding the events at Hillman, calling it a terroristic disinformation attack. Gallagher said Pitt has already begun a major review of its procedures, policies, and tools to respond to disinformation attacks, including a reassessment of ENS. Additionally, these incidents happened a little under a year after the Airbnb shootings in East Allegheny last April. 90 gunshots were fired at a party which hosted over 200 people. 11 people were shot and two teenagers died. The victims were Jaden Brown and Matthew Steffi Ross, both only 17 years old and weeks away from their high school graduation. A year later, police have not made any arrest in relation to their deaths. We have footage from the party and warning, some viewers may find this footage disturbing. <laughs> Come on, 
Video footage shows the shooter carrying a 9mm handgun. This is a semi-automatic gun capable of firing multiple rounds at a faster rate. This sparked conversations in the area about gun control and gun safety. Former Pittsburgh Police Chief Scott Schubert confirmed that shells associated with a long gun or AR-15 style rifle were also found on the scene. The recent incidents occur alongside gun violence across the country as people experience mass shooting threats real and fake every day. A report from NBC found that one in five Americans have been threatened by a gun and 19% of Americans say they had a family member killed by a gun. Just this week, at least five people were killed in a shooting at a bank in downtown Louisville, Kentucky. Police said the suspected gunman, a 25-year-old bank employee, also died at the scene. And late last month, a shooter claimed the lives of three nine-year-old children and three adults who worked at a private Christian elementary school in Nashville, Tennessee. This attack marks the 19th shooting at a school or university in 2023. According to the Gun Violence Archive, the U.S. has seen nearly 150 mass shootings so far this year and 14 mass murders where four or more people are killed in a single incident. These numbers come just 103 days into 2023, meaning on average the United States has seen more than one mass shooting every day. Officials from Pittsburgh Public Schools have filed a federal lawsuit against several international social media companies. The lawsuit alleges that these companies have created a mental health crisis with their, quote, addictive and dangerous social media platforms. The lawsuit propose, proposes that obsessive social media youth in youth is, quote, no accident. Our business and technology reporter, Aiden Dean Dunn, has, has more. more. Aiden, what's the word? Thank you, David. Instagram, Facebook, Snapchat, YouTube, TikTok, Twitter. These are household names these days with an almost ubiquitous presence in our everyday lives. Pittsburgh Public Schools have filed suit against each of these platforms, claiming that the apps target adolescent psychology with the intent to create compulsive usership, to reap profit from data collection, and in order at the risk of serious mental health damages. We spoke with Mitch Prinstein, PhD and Chief Science Officer of the American Psychological Association to better explain the research behind these allegations. I don't know whether it was intended or not, but it turns out that some of these social media tools are tapping right into some of our more primitive kind of brain responses in really dramatic ways. Pittsburgh's 271 page lawsuit claims that there is a mental health crisis in American youth and it's being fueled by these social media apps. The filing references the alleged use of the same behavioral and neurobiological tactics used to keep people hooked on these apps that were used by the cigarette industry and in products like slot machines. This issue has breached local, state, and national agendas with its noticeable inclusion in the Biden administration's four-part unity plan outlined during the 2022 State of the Union. The advisory to U.S. Surgeon General Vivek Murthy released a report called Protecting Youth Mental Health, and it noted that 81% of 14 to 22-year-olds said they used social media daily or almost constantly in 2020. So one of the first areas of the brain that changes as we start the process of puberty is an area that gives us a strong interest in interacting with our peers. Whenever someone nods, smiles, agrees with us, gives us some influence and power, we get a big dopamine and oxytocin hit from that part of the brain that develops first. Social media, interestingly, really targets that like a bullseye because it actually gives you a quantifying number as to how much you're getting that kind of attention and agreements and influence among your peers. Now, the idea of going viral, you know, means that you can get a worldwide response, potentially tons of likes and followers, you know, from something you do. It's kind of like that part of your brain responding on steroids. And, you know, that's really concerning because we just weren't built for that, right? We, we weren't built to, to have the possibility of getting that kind of a response to meet the normal adolescent craving for peer attention. Social media fame can seem like a quick ticket to glory, or at least to social acceptance. But in reality, are users more than just a dime, a data point, 
in the purse of these ultra-large social media platforms. For business and technology reporting, I'm Aiden Dean Dunn. Allie, David? David. Since 1910, the Pitt News has provided the Pitt community with accurate and timely news. They provide the student body with coverage on issues that affect students at the university and across the country. Hey, Allie, don't you work for the Pitt News? I sure do, David, so I'm especially proud to feature them on the show today. Let's take a look at the latest headlines. The 11th annual Dharana competition appreciates and embraces classical Indian dance. More than 200 people gathered in the August Wilson African American Cultural Center Theater Saturday evening, along with 2,000 viewers on YouTube. To watch the Dharana's Pitt's premier collegiate classical Indian dance, the link is in the Pitt News. Pitt grad union organizers emboldened by labor wins across the academia and it escalates efforts. Graduate students at Yale, John Hopkins, Syracuse, and several other universities have unionized with more than 90% support in the last six months, sparking hope among the organizers for similar victory at Pitt. Pitt women's basketball announces Tori Verdi as the new head coach. Let's hear what Pitt News has to say about this. Pitt women's basketball has not finished with a winning record since the 2014-15 season. Nevertheless, Verdi said he believes that Pitt is capable of winning, despite the recent mediocrity. I know that we can win here, Verdi said. I felt it from the moment I stepped foot on campus today. Today we will act like winners. Today we will act like winners. Today we will carry ourselves like winners and today. We will look like winners and today. We will look like winners for Dai has lofty goals for the program. When we come back, we're already seeing some hints at how the 2024 Pennsylvania Senate race is shaping up. And more in political news, see how tensions rose in Tennessee's House of Representatives this week. And we're telling you everything you need to know about the future of Pitt women's basketball under their new head coach announced just last week. You won't want to miss it. Stay tuned. The University Store on 5th is more than a college bookstore. We are independently owned and operated by the university, and we've been that way for more than 100 years. The consistent campus support allows us to respond to the changing needs of our customers, provide personalized service and quality merchandise, support the university's initiatives, and represent Pitt with Panther Pride. The U Store has all the course materials that you need. Whether you want to purchase or rent your books, or you're interested in digital materials, we can help. Looking for the latest tech and accessories? We carry all the biggest brands. As an Apple authorized campus store, you will receive the best in educational pricing on your favorite Apple products. Plus, our repair center and student technical support are conveniently located in the store and are ready to get your tech back in working order. Visit us to shop the latest pit apparel, school supplies, and the largest independent book selection in the city, all without leaving campus. And when it comes to services, visit the Center for Creativity, which offers members of the Pitt community a space to engage with their hands and minds. It's easy to shop online and pick up in store. We accept financial aid and Panther funds for your convenience. At the U Store, we put pride in everything that we do so that you can put Panther pride in everything that you do. So stop by today and let us help you. Hail the Pitt! Welcome back. Have you checked out our website yet? Well, if you haven't, give it a look. If you want to see all your Pit to the Point faves like me and David and stay up on current events, check us out on pittsofthepoint.com. And if you want to learn about the magic that happens behind the scenes and see more of our good-looking team like me and Allie, check us out on social media. You can find us on Instagram and Twitter at Pit to the Point and on Facebook at Pit to the Point. Check it out.
There's still eight months left in 2023, but we're already starting to see the 2024 election season shape up in Pennsylvania, as a number of candidates have officially announced their plans to run for office. It's really shaping up to be an intriguing race as some notable Republicans prepare to run against longtime seat holder Bob Casey. For more on the story, we go to our political reporter, Joey Tebbin. Joey, how's it looking? Well, in electoral politics, we often talk about the advantage of incumbency. Politicians who run for re-election are generally re-elected. It's almost ubiquitous. So when Pennsylvania Senator Bob Casey announced on Monday that he would run for re-election, Pennsylvania Democrats breathed a sigh of relief ahead of what could be one of the Democrats' toughest election seasons ever. Pennsylvania's senior U.S. Senator Bob Casey Jr. announced on Monday that he will run for re-election in 2024, attempting to defend a seat he's held since 2007. I'm officially in my re-election era, Casey's Twitter account posted on Monday, and it's a situation he knows all too well, coming from a political family and now running for Senate himself for the fourth time. Casey's expected to face some notable Republican opponents, including 2022 gubernatorial nominee Doug Mastriano and 2022 Senate primary candidate David McCormick. Beating Casey in 2024 will be a tough prospect for any Republican, though, says political analyst J. Miles Coleman. You know, it's probably not going to be the type of rip-roaring blockbuster contest like Fetterman Oz, because that was an open seat. You know, this time, you know, Pennsylvania is going to be closely contested at the presidential level, but you have a decently popular incumbent. So I wouldn't be surprised if Republicans try to prioritize some other states. In addition to defending seats in the political swing states of Pennsylvania, Arizona, Michigan, Nevada, and Wisconsin in 2024, Democrats also need to defend seats in Montana, Ohio, and West Virginia, three states that Donald Trump won in 2020 by wide margins. In 2016, it was the first time ever where every state voted exactly the same way as it did for president, as it did for Senate. So if that trend continues, I'd be looking at members like Sherrod Brown next door in Ohio, Joe Manchin also in West Virginia right next door, and John Tester. Those are states that I would expect the Republicans to win. A lot of those members won in years that were better for Democrats than there, and when there was more ticket splitting. It's a very difficult Senate map for Democrats in 2024, but for Pennsylvania Democrats at least, they're finding solace and hope in Bob Casey as a familiar candidate and a proven winner. For Pit to the Point, I'm your political reporter, Joey Tebbin. Thanks, Joey. Two Tennessee lawmakers were reinstated back into Tennessee's House of Representatives this week. Justin Pearson and Justin Jones, both members of the Democratic Party, were initially voted out for protesting gun violence on the House floor. Pearson and Jones, alongside State Representative Gloria Johnson, had led supporters in chants calling for stricter gun safety laws. This came after a mass shooting in Nashville killed six people, including three children. Democrats said the vote to expel Pearson and Jones, two black men, was rooted, rooted in racism, especially because Johnson was a white woman and was not expelled. Republicans denied allegations of racism and said the lawmakers' disorderly and disruptive conduct justified the expulsion. After Jones was reinstated just a day before Pearson, he said he will continue fighting for gun law reform and will not be silenced anymore. Mr. Speaker, I want to welcome the people back to the people's house. I want, to, I want to welcome democracy back to the people's house. That on last Thursday, members of this body tried to crucify democracy, but today we stand as a witness of a resurrection of a movement of a multiracial democracy that no unjust decision will stand. Yeah. We go to church. Yeah. These false solutions yeah. that they are advocating will not help or save anybody. Yeah. But a movement is right. It's just about time for our weekly college and high school report. That's right. Today we're joined live by some up and coming broadcasters at Lancaster Catholic High School. Let's take a look at what's going on with the Crusaders over in Lancaster County. Thanks, guys. This is Lancaster Catholic and I'm Zach Snyder. And I'm Chris Cavender. Here at Lancaster Catholic, we have a lot of really fun and long running traditions that make us who we are as a school. These traditions are very near and dear to us students, and we wanted to share one of them with you. This tradition started decades ago with the drama department. If you're a senior and in the spring musical cast, you are bestowed the honor of signing the walls of the backstage as well as the wings of the stage. Chris and I both signed our names this year during this set strike, along with our fellow seniors. And now, here's a sneak peek into this tradition at Langston Catholic. I'm Miss Sawolski and I graduated here at Langston Catholic in 2014. I remember my senior year signing the wall was, I don't know, it's like a rite of passage. It's 
so beautiful. Um, actually, when I was here, they ended up having to paint over a lot of the walls because they removed the curtains. My friends and I were so devastated because it was just the legacy of what the performing arts was here. Hi, my name's Joseph Martin. Signing the wall backstage was really important to me for a number of reasons. There were some really great performers at Lancaster Cafe before I got there, and there are some great ones now since I'm gone. And so just being a part, having my name be a part of that, getting to sign it last year myself was a really nice moment that I'm not gonna forget. It's really a shame we lost so many names when they painted the backstage a couple of years ago. But I'm not sure there would be room for the future generations if they didn't. That's true, there's definitely limited space back there. It is amazing to be able to be participating in a tradition that has existed for so long and is really important to so many people. This has been Lancaster Catholic. Back to you guys. Thanks. It's always so good to hear from you. Now, I have a question. What did signing that wall at the end of the year mean to you? For me personally, writing my name on that wall is kind of just like a big send off because I've been participating in the drama department for the last four years. So it's just really nice to be part of it. Oh, agreed. It's, it's an end, but it's also, it's bittersweet and it's the end, but it's, uh, it's still a happy moment. Definitely. I'm really curious, like how far back this tradition goes. What do you think the oldest show is on the wall? Um, I don't know about the specific show, but I know I've seen names that have signed up to back to like the 1970s. Oh, wow. Okay. That's like even that's, further yeah, back than I wow. thought. <laughs> Longer than any of us have been around. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you for joining us this morning. Thank you. Thank you. I'll say it again. It's always good to hear from Lancaster Catholic. Mm -hmm. He's such a talented young group. Coming up, it's all things sports. Tune in to see a sneak peek at Pitt football next season and how a legendary playoff streak came to a devastating end. We'll be right back. <laughs> So one inventive tool that the University of Pittsburgh has is Pitt Funds Me. So Pitt Funds Me is for outside scholarships that you can review and apply for as well. There's 8,000 plus scholarships on that website. These scholarships have been vetted as good and reliable resources, so you can guarantee that these are not resources that are trying to steal money or trying to scam you in any way. Any student has access to this, even admitted students who have not deposited yet. When you go into your my.pit.edu, you'll want to search in the Ask Kathy box, Pit Funds Me. And make sure instead of an S and Pit Funds Me, you're going to put a dollar sign. That will allow you to go into the portal to be able to look at all the outside scholarship opportunities that fit your specific profile. They will ask several questions. You do not have to answer all questions or any questions if you don't want to. But the more questions you answer, the more opportunities that become available to you to apply. Welcome back to Pitts the Point. Allie, it sure does seem that Pitt Athletics gets better by the year. Oh, definitely. And with even more exciting changes still on the horizon, Pitt women's basketball hired its new coach last week, and Pitt football is set to host their annual spring game to give us a glimpse into next season. For more on both developments, we go to our Pitt sports reporter, Donnie Blackwell. How are you looking, Donnie? Thanks, Allie and David. Last Friday... Last Friday, Heather Like had just announced that the new women's basketball coach will be former UMass head coach, Coach Tori Verdi. Now, with just four players remaining on the Pitt basketball roster, Verdi mentioned in his press conferences that he is ready to make up for the challenge that Pitt has to grow. And he mentioned that he is ready and ready to take on the challenge and wants to win now versus later. Coach Verdi has a pretty long resume when it comes to coaching basketball, and he is known for being a turnaround at programs. In his press conference on April 7, he tells the press how he is confident that he will get the job done and that a winning culture is expected to be brought back here to Pitt. AD Heather Like also mentions how Verdi was sort of an easy hire, being that the two had built a relationship back in their Eastern Michigan days and kept in contact over the years. Like has been making strong decisions lately here for Pitt, and... Both Verdi and Like are confident that there will be a change. Well, the first thing is they have to understand my expectations. And so that will be clear, uh, precise, they'll know exactly what I'm looking for. 
Um, you know, I'm very transparent. You know, I told our players, you know, from the get-go, when they're good, I'm going to tell them that they're good. When they stink, I'm going to tell them that they stink. And uh, that's the only way I can. But I will tell you, he, I think he's endured um, what it takes to continue to build a program. And he's not afraid of the challenge at that next level. And he's hungry for it. And so I think just just overall maturity as far as the you know the depth of relationships he has with players over the years and who he stayed in contact you can tell that um, I think those all those sorts of things matter to him and I, I recognize that when we visited and uh, we're gonna sell this I, I think we have an unbelievable arena we have unbelievable resources here um, and the campus I mean it's it, I just we will convince players to come here and once they come in, once they step foot on campus, I know they'll fall in love with the university. He just described it as a campus unlike any other place he had ever been. And so Pitt, he described was incredibly unique and something he felt that he could absolutely recruit. Now, spring ball is finally coming to an end. And which means that it is time for the blue and gold spring game. The game will take place this Saturday, April 15th at 1 p.m. at Acroshore Stadium. And Coach Narduzzi just announced that the guys will be taking a different approach into playing this year, hoping to give the guys a little bit more of competition and a push. And in some media conferences, it seems that all of the guys are on board. Since Pat Narduzzi has been Pitt's head coach, they've always done a blue and gold draft for the spring game. But this year, that's changing. We're just going to play the game. It'll be... You know, offense versus defense, and uh, offense will be on one side, defense on the other, and we'll play ball. So um, I think it'll be a good look at what we've got, and, uh, you know, I'm excited to try something different. And uh, our guys will go out and compete. It'll be, it'll be pretty good. It'll be better than what we see. Not only is there a new format, but there's an entirely new scoring system. Pat Narduzzi is changing the rules a little bit for this spring game. Uh, but the offense scores like they score, except I think we give them a point for a first down. So we just kind of, so the offense gets a first uh, point for a first down, defense gets a point for a three and out. Uh, defense gets points if they get turnovers. You know, you lose points if you have penalties. So if you jump off sides, it's gonna cost you a point, you know, plus five yards. So that's kind of how it goes. So we'll give you all the scoring, um, you know, TFLs and sacks, defense gets points. Since Pat Narduzzi became Pitt's head coach, there's always been a blue and gold draft every year. But the players are welcoming the change, and in fact, they're already making plenty of declarations about who is going to win on the field on Saturday. We're going to beat them up. It ain't, they cool. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we're going to get them. It's, it's going to be good. We're both team, both sides going to get better. Um, I, I think I will win the, the uh, spring game. That's, I'm, I'm pretty confident in it. You know, we're putting everything together, so it's, you know, it's all coming together. You know, the first two scrimmages, we were super close, just turnovers, you know. Now, with Narduzzi wanting to take a different approach, I got a chance to sit and talk to Pitt's senior cornerback, MJ Devonshire, and he mentions that the new style will be beneficial for this young team, as he mentioned yesterday after practice. We are here with MJ Devonshire, one of the yeah. main corners for Pitt Panthers, and he just finished up his last spring ball game and is preparing to show off everything that he's been working on this spring on Saturday. So how are you preparing to be a leader for this team this year? And what are you doing now in spring ball to show your team that you are a leader? Um, working on being more vocal, you know, just communicating with the guys, whether a young guy, old guy, and learning how to communicate and how different people respond on the team. Everybody doesn't respond the same and everybody doesn't respond to yelling. So you got to be able to get your message across to either guy, any guy on the team. And just learning how to do that has been a big jump for me this spring. So have you taken a different approach when you talk to the younger guys, you know, to make them comfortable? Yeah, definitely. I've been more encouraging. They hear enough hard times from the coaches. The coaches are always on them. So just being encouraging and letting them know that sometimes, you know, sometimes people need to hear they're doing a good job. So just being in those young guys' corners and letting them know, just keep going, keep pushing, keep working. Okay, and in some previous media interviews, you mentioned how you wanted to bulk up and how last season you felt like, you know, not pushed around, but, you know, kind of, have some trouble with the bulkier receivers. So yeah. how do you think bulking up will improve your game? Um, just allow me to not be able to get pushed off as much and guys just not to be able to move me around. You know, being a physical guy, you got to be able to have the weight and make it through a season. So being putting on weight and making it through the season will definitely help at the end of the year. When it comes to playing a big receiver, I won't be worn down. My body won't be as tired. I'll be able to hold my own weight. You guys are doing a different format for this year's spring game. Um, how do you feel that will benefit the team? Um, 
just getting reps. You know, everybody will get reps and coaches will be able to coach their position. And last year, you know, when you do a draft, sometimes you got the corners coach on the opposite team from us. So we're not getting coached by him directly during game day. But this year, but the offense, defense, the Coach Collins will be able to coach all of us and see all of our reps and be only worried about. The spring game will take place tomorrow at 1 p.m. and will be aired live on ACC Network. And you can catch the full interview between MJ Devonshire and I on our Pit to the Point website. For Pit to the Point, I'm your Pit sports reporter, Donnie Blackwell. Josh, let us in on some city sports. Thank you, Donnie. That was a great story. The Pittsburgh Penguins had an opportunity to make history this week as they aimed to extend their record run of 16 consecutive playoff seasons. And on Monday, they received some great news as the team just one point ahead of them in the standings, the New York Islanders fell in an upset to the Washington Capitals. This was huge because the Penguins would now control their own playoff fate. Win the final two games, you're in. Lose, though. And Sidney Crosby might be watching playoff hockey from his couch for the first time since the Bush administration. It was go time for the Penguins this week, with just one point separating them from the final wild card in the National Hockey League standings. Pittsburgh tried to secure their 17th consecutive playoff berth. Down one nothing to the Chicago Blackhawks on Tuesday night, Penn's legend Avani Malkin ties up the contest with a third period goal. However, the Blackhawks would quickly recapture the lead and score this shorthanded goal to seal the deal in the contest. Here's the raw reaction from Penguins coach Mike Sullivan. Well, it's you know obviously we're we're all disappointed uh, that we missed an opportunity last night. And uh, and so from that standpoint, we're all human. We all have emotions, and and uh, you know we've got to we've got to live with those. The other aspect of it is is that uh, is that we're not we're not out of the playoffs until we're out of the playoffs. And Coach Sullivan was right. The Penguins were still mathematically alive, but they need help on Wednesday night from the Montreal Canadiens to keep that dream alive. Early on, Islanders, Canadians, Brock Nelson. Gets the Islanders out ahead. Now tie, but here's Hudson Fashing to score a goal and put the Islanders back out ahead 2-1 to one late in the first period, and it would get worse from there if you're a Pens fan. Here's Brock Nelson again. That's his second goal of the game. And to top it all off, the nail in the coffin, that's Anders Lee. Islanders win 4-2, to clinching the final wild card, and the Penguins are out of the playoffs for the first time since 2006. Evgeny Malkin, Sidney Crosby, Chris Letang, they all came up together. They all won together. And they are all faces of the Pittsburgh Penguins franchise together for the past decade plus. Their wins, specifically their three championships, their personal accolades and achievements all speak for themselves. Penguins fans, of course, and hockey fans in general, will not soon forget this recent run of unwavering success by the Pittsburgh Penguins organization. But now, it's time for the Penguins front office to begin building the next dynasty. For Pit to the Point, I'm City Sports reporter Josh Byrne. David, Allie. Thanks, Josh. What a heartbreaker. Coming up, we're taking a deep dive into some of the most creative mental health treatments out there. See how they're changing the face of therapy. And don't miss how outstanding Pitt's largest fundraising event of the year is. Plus, you might think you've got moves, but this club at Pitt is really bringing the heat, even taking part in national competitions. All that and more after the break. We are the University of Pittsburgh. Forged in a blue-collar city with gold standards. We're innovators, researchers, thinkers, and healers are always reaching for new heights. There is no limit to what we can accomplish when we put our minds, our hands, our soul, and spirit to it. Here, progress is always in progress. Hail to Pitt. Proud partner of the ACC.
is short for Hail to Pit, our Panther fight song. But we also use it to express just how much we love it here. There are so many reasons to hail, but here are just a few. Hail to Cassie! Hail to the Nationality Room. To WPTS Radio. Hail to Oakland. Hail to Shumley Plaza. Hail to Forbes Avenue. Hail to the Towers. Hail to Cardiac Hill. To Hillman Library. Hail to the University of Thrissburg. Hail to Pittsburgh. Hail to Heinz Field. Hail to Pitt. It's starting to feel like winter is finally behind us. It's been nice and warm all week. The sun is out. I think I might finally be catching a tan. Eh, I think you got some work to do. <laughs> and I could not be more thrilled. It's so nice to go outside again. I just love it when the sun's out. Yeah, same here. But, you know, the sun is good for more than just improving our moods. It's also really good for energy. Pitt Bradford held a conference to showcase advances in solar energy this week. The opening the new Duke Engineering and Information Sciences building in January to adding two new engineering technology majors this past semester, the Energy Institute at Pitt Bradford has had a 15 year overnight success. And its latest venture was a solar conference this past Monday. And the Energy Institute's goal here on our campus is to um, develop curriculum and majors involving energy, um, to deliver sort of an intro to energy class across the curriculum, um, general elective. I think I said this at our building dedication. A lot of people feel like, okay, we got this done. We hosted our conference. We, um, but we're really just getting started. We've, we, this is just a whole nother um, level of engagement that we hope to sustain in our community. And I think it's going to have real impacts. My presentation was actually about um, looking at this idea of energy and, and the conversations that folks are having around this idea of solar energy in particular, and using that as sort of a catalyst to think about our communities in general and what we want the future community to look like. The argument that I was putting forth is that, you know, we see that when we start to explore issues of, of green energy, sustainability, resilience, that that opens the door for us to start having conversations about what do we want our community to look like? What vision do we have for our community? Pitt Bradford and the Energy Institute are finally seeing the results of their 15 years of hard work, but they're still looking towards the future to improve the Institute and Bradford's community as a whole. To learn more about the presentations from the various solar industry leaders and researchers, go to the Solar Conference's website at upb.pitt.edu slash solar conference 2023. From Pit to the Point, I'm your regional campus reporter, Laura Stravick. Allie, David? The University of Pittsburgh is located right around the corner from the Hill District, a neighborhood with an incredibly rich cultural history. That's right. In fact, one of the most famous Pittsburghers in history is the prolific playwright August Wilson, who lived in the Hill District. Our Pit Beat reporter, Shay Sweeney, is going to tell us how Pitt's library archive system is keeping his story alive. Shay? Thanks, guys. So this week, we were able to take a closer look at some of the work of August Wilson, a stunning Pittsburgh native and renowned playwright who is being represented in our library currently. The archive dedicated to his work highlights some of his masterful writings portraying Pittsburgh's Hill District throughout the 1900s. Students and the public have been able to conduct research and even create their own exhibits based on some of the pieces in the archive. The collection really encourages viewers to get involved in some of his work as it opens up a new side of August Wilson that few have seen before. The archive documents his greatest successes and personal inspirations. His family graciously contributed artifacts and mementos to create an exhibit that celebrates his accomplishments. We acquired the collection um, in the fall of 2020. Um, it's a fairly large collection. It is 450 boxes of material. And I think it's really just a treasure trove um, chronicling Wilson's writing career. There's correspondence, there's his personal library, there's his personal music collection. So there's all these personal touches as well. 
the end goal is to share this collection as broadly as possible, whether that's with the Pitt community, the students and faculty here, whether that's the broader community of Pittsburgh or internationally. We had our first international researcher from the UK to use the collection. So broadly as possible to share these materials, there's no point in acquiring a collection like this and then just having it sit on a shelf and not get used. Wilson's displayed works capture and preserve the vibrant cultural voice of the Hill District community here in Pittsburgh. As politically relevant as ever, the themes of racial equality, community, and activism in his works will live on through this collection. What Wilson did, like elevating the language and the life and the culture of people in the Hill District to where it's recognized, you know, nationally, internationally, it was really an amazing feat. And so for the people in the Hill District to be able to recognize themselves in his plays, to be able to have access to these materials, to see it celebrated, to see it brought to them, I think, I think it's just really, really powerful. The August Wilson Archive is located on the third floor of the Hillman Library. You should definitely visit to interact with the exciting digital display and use some of the resources to educate and inspire. Also coming up, we have some events produced by students who were influenced by the archive. For more information on the collection and some of these upcoming events, go to their website at augustwilson.library.pit.edu. For Pitch to the Point, I'm Pitt Beat reporter, Shay Sweeney. Ali, David? Thanks, Shay. The national conversation about mental health grows more and more prevalent by the day. And beyond your traditional therapy or medications, people are finding some much more creative treatments. That's right. And this week, we cover a rather colorful solution to improving one's mental health, art therapy, which is being used more and more to address this issue. For more, we go to our Medical Minute with Anthony Siki. Guys, so there's nothing more important than taking care of yourself, especially your mental health. And therapy is one of the most common ways that people take care of their mental health. But it's not always a one size fits all. There are so many different types of therapy, especially right here in Pittsburgh, that help people express themselves in various ways depending on their needs. And sometimes what people need is an artistic outlet. Art therapy is exactly what it sounds like. It's a type of therapy that uses the creative process of art to allow clients going through therapy to express themselves in more creative and artistic ways. It is an evidence-based uh, therapeutic modality. It is an accredited degree, master's level degree with a, its own unique licensure. So a board certified art therapist is going to be able to help recognize what your goals are in therapy take that into consideration of how we can use different art mediums to really facilitate exploring that and get you closer to what your goals are. Many people feel that they need to have artistic talent to participate in art therapy, but that couldn't be further from the truth. A lot of folks coming in, you know, really haven't done art since they were maybe like in elementary school or middle school. So it's kind of a scary experience. Art therapy has been proven to improve cognitive and sensory motor function, enhance social skills, reduce stress, and even develop emotional resilience. The left side of our brain, very cognitive, um, analytical side when we're just doing verbal processing. And when we add art into that, we get to switch over to the right side of the brain. So we get this whole new experience of processing things that otherwise might not have really been able to bounce between both sides of the brain. We really only would have been processing it on the left side. One study conducted included 66 elderly women with major depressive disorder. And through weekly treatments of art therapy, both depressive and anxiety symptoms were drastically reduced. Expressing yourself is key when it comes to your mental health, and art therapy allows us to do so in a much more artistic and creative way. Now, while using art as therapy and art therapy are not the same thing, they do share similar traits. They force us to use both sides of our brains to express ourselves in ways never imaginable. Now, next time you're feeling overwhelmed, reach for that pen and paper and let those thoughts flow. From Pit to the Point, I'm your medical reporter, Anthony Siki, David, Ali. Thanks, Anthony. The Pitt Dance Marathon is the largest student-run philanthropy event at the University of Pittsburgh. Since 2005, it's raised over $2 million for local Pittsburgh charities. In fact, the 2022 Pitt Dance Marathon won Dance Marathon of the Year, raising a grand total of $366,817.32, benefiting the UPMC Children's Hospital Foundation. This year's dance marathon theme was Lighting the Way, and it brought together hundreds of Pitt students who helped raise money for UPMC and the Children's Miracle Network. 
The 12 hour long event proved to be monumental for fundraising, raising a grand total of $340,151.23, showing, showing how strong the pig community really is. Hell to kids. Coming up, have you ever wanted to become an actor? I know I have. Well, we have just the place for you. That's right here in Pittsburgh. And we're giving you a look at one of Pitt's many dance clubs. This one specializing in classical Indian dance. Stay tuned, Pittsburgh. Welcome back to Pitt's The Point, your morning news magazine show. But be sure to check out Pitt Tonight, the university's best and only late night talk show. From a live studio audience to sketch comedy to a house band and hilarious show host Nick Cassano, it's definitely worth checking out Pitt Tonight. And this week is your last chance to do it. Tomorrow night at 7.30 at the Ross Studio in the, in, in the Cathedral of Learning. You won't want to miss the season finale of Pit Tonight. This week's special guest will be award-winning journalist and media personality, personality Natalie Bensavanga, who founded Bensi Productions and co-founded X Squared Media. David, did I ever tell you that I had the lead in the sixth grade school play? <laughs> Get out. What show? It was Shirley Holmes and the Hound of the Baskervilles. I was Shirley, obviously. And I've really been thinking about reviving my acting career lately. Well, I got just the place for you. Ensemble Actor Studio is an actor training studio in McKees Rocks. For a closer look, we go to our City Beat reporter, Natalie Bellin. Natalie? Whether you're trying to be a Hollywood starlet or you're striving to hone in and polish your acting skills, Maybe you're in need of a demo reel or a professional headshot. Ensemble's Actor Studio is a one-stop shop. Founder and artistic director Jamie Slavinsky has created a spot for actors to launch their careers. Ensemble Actor Studio is an artistic home for actors here in Pittsburgh. So acting really can make the world a better place. It, it can. I mean, it sounds it sounds a little silly, um, but. It's important work that I'm doing and I feel like I'm absolutely in the right place. We're building lifelong friendships here at Ensemble. Lifelong friendships that, that support one another and encourage one another and are there for one another in this business because it can be cutthroat out there. You know, there's a lot of competition and the last thing you wanna do is to be in this game alone. All of the classes here are different. We start out with something a little personal to me, kind of call it actor church, where we just have like a recap of what we learned last class, um, what we're thankful for, you know, what are the what are the aha moments that we had in last class and what are the things that we really think we need to work on in this class. And then we get down to business. You know, our motto here is we prepare so that we can play. Um, we think before we act so that we can act before we think. Um, and every class is different, but every class is full of inspiration. It's full of fun. We laugh nonstop because there's no pretense here and there's no judgment here in this classroom. It's just really getting down to the nitty gritty of what it takes to be an actor and then doing it because it feels good. Considering Pittsburgh is a hotspot for films and theater is an important part of the community because it brings everyone together. Ensemble Actors Studio is an artistic home for Pittsburgh. For more information, please go to www.ensembleactors.com. For Pit to the Point, I'm City Beat reporter, Natalie Bellin. Allie, David? Thanks, Natalie. This week for Clubbing at Pitt, we are highlighting Dirana. This is a group of students that competes in national Indian classical dance competitions every year. Let's get groovy. Looking for a new club? Look no farther than Dirana, a club that spreads classical Indian dance and helps the local community. Dirana is a classical Indian dance competition. It's the first of its kind in Pittsburgh. We bring teams from across the nation and have them compete on our stage. Um, so usually we have around eight teams competing. We, it's a whole weekend long event um, and we raise money for the Birmingham Free Clinic, which is a free clinic near us that provides health care for the under or uninsured. Dirana is all about spreading goodness, not only to the pit community, but to the next generation. 
It is exposing younger Indian kids who are actually learning this art form. Um, they may feel like they don't want to pursue it in college, but we try to show them that it's a really cool thing to do and that there are opportunities in at the collegiate level to um, pursue this art form. Universities including Tufts, The Ohio State, and Purdue were all represented at Dirana this past weekend. So we get to talk to them and try and figure out how they can continue um, putting out the classical arts for the general population to see. So um, it's really just sharing our love for art and it's obviously working. Since 2012, Dirana has raised over $100,000 for the Birmingham Free Clinic. Um, right now, we're trying to donate at least $7,000 to the Burning Every Clinic. For more information, check out these links. When we come back after the break, see what's got all of Pitt's students finally out of their winter hibernation. And stay right there to see a celebration of the town we call home and what makes the city of Bridges the city of black and gold. Don't miss it. <laughs> Welcome back to Pits to the Point. For everything from politics to sports, entertainment to medicine, Pits to the Point is the place to be. If you want to stay up to date on the latest, be sure to keep tuning in every Friday at 8 a.m. from now until April 21st. You can catch our show every Friday at 8 a.m. on the University of Pittsburgh's YouTube page. If you just so happen to miss it, never fear. You can see a replay of the show at noon on Saturday on CBSN, KDKA's streaming platform. Now, we have a confession to make. I know that David and I seem like total yinzers, but we're actually not from here. That's right. We're Philly Johns. We eat cheesesteaks, and our favorite saying is none other than, wait for it, go, go birds. birds. But as Pitt students, we have loved getting to know the city of Pittsburgh and everything that makes Western Pennsylvania very special. In fact, coming up, there's a special event devoted to our second favorite city. Our entertainment reporter, Lindsay Beck, has the scoop. Lindsay? Thanks guys. So if you're from around here, you've definitely heard the word. And if you're not from around here, you'll hear it sooner or later. Yins is a word that encapsulates the very essence that is the city of Pittsburgh. And what better way to embrace the Yinzer culture than to dedicate an entire convention to Yinzers and all things Western Pennsylvania. YinzerCon, a brand new convention dedicated to celebrating all things Western Pennsylvania, kicks off for the first time this Saturday, April 15th. Yins is a word many people associate with Pittsburghese, a dialect that people from the city of Pittsburgh have proudly taken on. Being a Yinzer is something to boast, something to celebrate. And the founder of YinzerCon, Don Spagnolo, says that this is his exact reason for hosting this convention. It's just going to be like one big gathering because Pittsburgh is kind of like one big extended family with crazy aunts and crazy uncles. YinzerCon's first annual convention will be located at Remixed by the Steel City Galleries in Belvernon. Remixed is a retail store experience that holds a vast collection of Steel City memorabilia. Yinzers, these passionate people of Pittsburgh, couldn't be more excited about the convention. Everyone is so passionate about, passionate about the things that make Pittsburgh Pittsburgh. My family is obsessed with the Steelers. We have taken our Christmas card pictures, all seven of our cousins, for the past like 20 years. Food is obviously a great aspect. So many different cultures like intertwined. The entire day dedicated to YinzerCon is packed with iconic Pittsburgh cultural figures, food, and celebrities. Some of this year's lineup include guests such as Donnie Football, Pittsburgh Iron Man, several Pittsburgh sports icons, and KDKA's Mary Hours, who is especially excited about attending the convention. This is more like personal. I do what I do for everyone else. For me to be able to go to something like this and have people come up to me, I just love meeting everyone and it really, it's, it's a fun thing to do. Admittance to YinzerCon this year is limited and only available by purchasing a ticket, each including access to the venue, autograph signings, and shopping credit to the remixed retail store. Now, I'm not originally from Pittsburgh, but I've definitely taken on a lot of that contagious Pittsburgh pride. You guys, or Yin's guys, should go get your tickets to YinzerCon. You're not going to want to miss it. From Pit to the Point, I'm your entertainment reporter, Lindsay Beck. Allie, David. Thanks, Lindsay. Before you go, I have to ask, uh, since you've come to Pitt in Pittsburgh, what's been your favorite thing about the city? 
Oh man, there's there's so many things. Obviously, pierogies are just a huge thing here. Obviously, the pens, go pens. Um, I think my favorite thing is probably Pramani's. Big fan of those sandwiches with the French fries. That's a classic. Yeah, I feel like that's that's a really good one. Yeah, it's a good good answer. Well, well thank you, you Lindsay. Personally, personally, I prefer a cheesesteak from D'Alessandro's, yeah. but that's just me. <laughs> hey, Ali, what are you doing after the show today? Well, you know, I'm thinking about hitting the quad, maybe grabbing some ice cream. I just, I have to be outside with all this amazing weather. And I'm not the only one. Pitt students have been coming out of hibernation this week and are all over campus. Spring has sprung in Pittsburgh. However, instead of the typical rainy spring days Pittsburgh has come to expect, residents were instead treated to several days of sunshine and temperatures in the high 70s to low 80s. Not wanting to let this opportunity slip them by, students at Pitt have been taking advantage of the gorgeous weather. Heavy winter coats have been ditched in lieu of shorts and t-shirts, and students have begun migrating outside to experience the beauty Oakland has to offer. Certainly not helping any cases of senioritis, Students are storming the Cathedral Lawn, Shenley Plaza, and the Quad, amongst other locations, to soak up the sun. Groups have been forming for impromptu games of pickup soccer and spike ball. Sunbathers are laying out on Soldiers and Sailors Lawn to catch some rays, and hammocks have been infiltrating the trees near Carnegie Library. Although the rain is expected to return over the course of the next week, and temperatures are supposed to go back to the high 50s to low 60s, there are still plenty of days left to enjoy the great outdoors. It's also a sign that summer is right around the corner, as is the end of another exciting school year at Pitt. That brings us to the end of today's show, which means that David and I are almost done with anchoring Pitt to the Point for you guys. Time really does fly when you're having fun. We hope you tune in next Friday for another great show of Pit to the Point. Once again, I'm Allie Ross. And I'm David Altman. Pit to the Point is your number one news source for all things happening at Pit, all the way to the, the point. point. We can't thank you enough for tuning in this morning on Pit to the Point. Thanks. Catch you next week.